Hey guys, and welcome to part two of the 7,000 subscriber special Q&A series. Um, yeah, we're going to get straight to the questions, but before I continue, I'd like to thank White Coach Mentoring for making this video possible. They offer super duper good mock interviews, which are meant to be really realistic for your, uh, or in preparation for your uh, medical interviews. So yeah, do go and check them out in the description below. Anyway, first question from Halima. Um, while applying for medical experience, are there any fields that are preferred by unis? Also, what are the universities do you advise for medicine? So, okay, let me answer your first question. Um, what fields of work experience are preferred by universities? Well, I know first and foremost, you want to try and get a variety of different experiences. Try and get a GP placement. I know they're hard to come by. Uh, try and get one hospital placement where you're shadowing a physician and also try and get a surgery experience because then you get to see what surgery is like, but also all the, um, all the bits and bobs that happen behind the scenes of surgery. Also, I really recommend, I think unis love this, a long-term volunteering experience. For those of you who are interested in Oxford and Cambridge, maybe go and try and visit a research laboratory in a field that you're interested in, because that sort of stuff could be really useful to talk about when it comes to your interviews. Now for the second question that you've asked, what other universities do you prefer? Well, it really is subjective. It depends on what you want out of medical school. I know others are more research-based. The courses are different. You've got everything from a traditional course like Oxford and Cambridge to an integrated course such as um, UCL and Imperial. And then you've got the PBL, the problem-based learning universities, who have another different approach to how they teach medicine. Not just that, the location might make a big difference. Um, the feel of the university, for me, um, you know, the universities I chose, I felt as if they had to have something scenic about them. So UCL has a cruciform building, but also it's in the middle of London, a you know fantastic city. Same applies to King's. Cambridge, well, it's Cambridge, isn't it? And Bristol also is a really, really beautiful university, um, you know, in a really nice environment. Also, I want to say, don't just go by league tables because some universities really rise and fall in the league tables. They might jump up 15 pips in the league table and then fall down 20 the next year. So don't go by that. Also, I think med school choice depends on your grades. You want to apply to med schools, which sort of um, you have the best chance for given the grades that you have, especially your entrance exam grades. Yeah, keep that in mind. Next question, Subhan Ahmed. How long a day do you do you each subject A level? I think you mean to ask how long did I spend per subject per day um, at A level? So I took physics, chemistry, biology, and maths um, all to A2. So for the full A level, um, I know my school physics teacher, who actually got a triple fest from Cambridge in physics, which is pretty impressive, um, he recommended at least doing one hour per subject per day throughout the year. That did include homework, revision, etc. But then he said, you know, going by that uh, rule of thumb, that would mean sufficient work. But for me, I think I prioritised whichever subject I had, maybe the next day, maybe a test in one subject the day, the day after. So I'd rather prefer to spend more time on that subject to make sure I can do well in the test. And to be fair, if you are good with time, you can maybe even do a bit more work. But sort of see what works for you. For the harder subjects, yes, maybe do spend a bit more time um, making sure you you work. But then again, revision isn't all about time. It's about how you use that time. Are you doing effective past papers or are you just sitting there reading a textbook half asleep? Next question, Survivor 99, do you have any regrets? So just turning down opportunities in the last five years. If so, what advice do you have for your viewers about this? Good question. Um, well, I have always tried my best to not turn down opportunities. The fact that someone has considered me to be worthy enough to invest in and, you know, to for them to offer me this opportunity of whatever sort, um, I consider that very valuable. But then again, for, for opportunities that I have turned down or even haven't gone after that I think I would have gotten if I'd gone after, I think it's because it was just a matter of priorities. To be fair, actually, I wouldn't say I've turned down many opportunities, mainly because actually the way you've worded the question, you make it sound as if you are given opportunities on like a golden plate, when in fact you have to spot opportunities. And I feel as if I do spot many opportunities, mainly because I look out for those opportunities. And yeah, like I mentioned, because I didn't, number one, think of them as being as valuable as other experiences, for me, but also because I simply wouldn't have had the time to do them. So my advice would be, it's not as if opportunities aren't there. It's not as if you're just completely unlucky. You simply have to look for things. And once you sort of are aware of things that being around you, opportunities start to rise very quickly. So yeah, be proactive um, when it comes to those things. 
Kevin B Piano, what has been your best moment at Cambridge so far? The best thing about Cambridge is simply the best general moment, which actually happens quite a lot, is when you find yourself surrounded by extremely motivated and extremely clever people. I feel as if at Cambridge or even here at Oxford, where I'm now, my research placement, just simply so many of those people are concentrated in one place. And wherever you go, you often end up meeting the most amazing of people, the most talented of people. Um, and sometimes you sort of you know, have a conversation with someone and when you're going home, you're like, yikes, that was a pretty, pretty intense conversation. We actually learned quite a lot. Um, so yeah, some of the best moments so far or moments has been simply meeting so, so many talented, clever, and just amazing people. Um, I think that's what that's what makes Cambridge. Manny, hey son, really enjoying your content right now. Just wanted to ask you what advice would you give someone in year 12 who wants to apply to medicine at Oxford? How do you stand out? Okay, really good question. I think if I tell you this advice on how you can stand out, I think everyone's going to start standing out because a lot of people watch these videos. But I would say year 12 is an important year. Make sure you nail your work experience, but also begin with your personal statement early. Firstly, brainstorm everything you've done. When I say everything, literally stuff from year 10 onwards, every experience, from every sport to every club to every society to every cake sale you've um, helped organise. So firstly, brainstorm all of that, then begin writing a personal statement early. Do not leave entrance exam preparation too late. Entrance exams make a huge difference to your application, so don't leave them too late. You're asking how do you stand out? Yes. If you just sort of expose yourself to that content really early on, you'll have a basic idea of what that exam is, instead of having no clue at all about that, about that exam. Then, when you do actually come to start revising, you'll know all the basics, then you can actually get down to revision quite quickly. Now, the next thing is research. So you need to realise that Oxford and Cambridge are research-oriented universities. What does that mean? Well, they simply value people who are interested in research. Why? Because those universities, the reason why they're the best, or one of the reasons is because they produce really high quality research and they just churn it out, which actually is applied everywhere in the world. How can you show that? I don't know, maybe you've come across a condition on work experience. Go read up on it. Read about the pathology of the disease. Then maybe look up a few drugs that they're testing to help people with, it, with that disease. And lastly, maybe look at the epidemiology, which populations are more likely to get the disease and how can we prevent it? What current public health strategies are available? So look up all these things. And ultimately, if you show them that, okay, fine, you've read papers, you've done this, you've been proactive in sort of watching a few YouTube videos, watching a few TED Talks on, the, on these matters. That is what Cambridge and Oxford look for. Obviously, they don't expect you to be a researcher. They don't expect you to be a scientist. You're still 17 when you apply. They just want to see the beginnings of that. Now, all of this is in addition to the core stuff, which is ultimately work experience and volunteering. So don't sacrifice work experience and volunteering time to do like pure research because then when you get to applying they'll be like well why aren't you doing natural sciences. Okay next question, our enigma, hey what are your tips for dealing with stress? Okay that's a good question. Stress, I think everyone experiences stress in, you know, in one form or another. Before I give you tips on how to actually deal with stress, it's much easier to avoid it. How can you avoid it? Firstly, make sure you know the deadline but also understand what work you've got to do when you get the work. So if a teacher gives you an assignment and it doesn't make sense, go and speak to the teacher straight away. Number two, to avoid stress, you must do things ahead of deadlines. As soon as you get the work, try and do it and get rid of it so that you know that when the deadline does come, other people might be panicking, but you'll be fine because you did the work early on. The last thing to avoid stress is to simply manage your time better in terms of do activities that relieve your stress. So don't let it accumulate. But okay, fine, now I'm stressed. I've got lots of work to do. My brain's hurting. Half of the situations where people have headaches is because they haven't drunk enough water. So firstly, if you are stressed, just make sure you stay hydrated. Secondly, when you're super stressed with work, you've got to be realistic. You've only got, I don't know, 10 hours. You want to see, okay, what can I actually do in these 10 hours? And actually be productive in these 10 hours. The last thing you want to do is just sit there worrying about the work you need to do for 10 hours and then realizing that you haven't done any of that 10 hours later. You need to sit down and be like, okay, realistically, I can get this task done, this task done. Maybe for this third task, I might just have to send my teacher an email and ask for an extension. Start prioritizing when you're in a stressed mindset. And when it comes to just stress in general, I think it's just about looking 
to whether you've got too much on your plate? Do you simply just have too many responsibilities, too many activities to sort of remember and stay on top of? And if you do, maybe try and use a planner, maybe try and use a phone to help you organize yourself, or maybe just think, right, if I give up this activity, fine, I won't get the CV points, fine, I won't get the fun of doing it, or how I'm doing it, but then I do sort of relieve myself of a lot of stress. Alina Hassan, what is your best tip to do good in A-level chemistry? So A-level chemistry is number one to try and understand the concepts from first principles. So a lot of chemistry nowadays is about the nitty gritty detail, especially how that detail applies to the application of chemistry instead of just memorizing chemistry. So for this, I'd say make use of online resources, whether it's YouTube, whether it's certain revision sites, whether it's notes other people have written. Try and visualize what's happening when it comes to the chemistry. Experiments especially, they're not actually that hard to think about, you're just mixing two chemicals together. So when it comes to experiments, firstly make sure you understand the method, what are you doing, then understand what's the chemistry behind it. And usually for most experiments there's only like one main sort of mechanism you're sort of, uh, you're investigating. Bank clash. When are you collabing with Kenji and Karma Medic? I've actually been in touch with Karma Medic. We are looking to collaborate, but we're both super busy. So um, in the near future. Kenji, I'm not too sure. We should definitely collaborate sometime though in the future. Um, cookies, congratulations, Sen. What inspired you to do engineering and medicine? Well, I think ever since you know I was young, I was always like drawing just weird concepts in terms of planes and cars in the back of books which fine, a lot of kids do. But then when it came to medicine, obviously, you know, during my GCSEs and sixth form, I thought to myself, right, I'm doing medicine. Cool, I got into med school, did two years of medicine. But then why did I switch? Good question. Well, I th really started seeing how, especially in my like, work experience placements, um, how there was a real lack of sort of cross, sort of cross-discipline collaboration, if that makes sense. Often engineers have their ways of doing things, their ways of developing things, and doctors have their ways of doing things, their way of applying sort of their clinical knowledge to situations and problems. But there are very few people who actually understand both sides of the argument that can help link the two professions together. Obviously in the last few years this has changed rapidly and you know I'm hoping to sort of have an input in that change. But the thing is with engineering and medicine, as we can all see, medicine is becoming more and more technology dependent. So I think doing engineering will give me not just the mathematical skills to help me, I don't know, develop something in the future, not just the engineering skills, like the, you know, the ways of designing and planning and sort of seeing what works for the future. I think engineering will just help me understand medicine in a different way. Next question, Harry Soma. Hi son, I really enjoy your videos and I've noticed that you do a lot of extra quick activities. So my question is, why do you enjoy doing so many activities and is it important for Augsburg? So yeah, this year I've been doing a few less extra quick activities than usual. So I completely dropped rowing, which is such a good decision because it was taking up a lot of my time. I'd rowed for many years, it wasn't fun anymore for me. Okay, fair enough. This year, the activities I'm doing, so I shoot and I play polo, they take, they take up much less time, which now allows me to focus more on my engineering degree which is very different to medicine actually, and so requires a lot more effort and time. I don't think you get in because you do lots of extra curricular activities, but I think the reason for the correlation between, you know, the people getting in and the fact that they do quite a few different activities is because people who, from a young age, do many activities just get better at certain things, such as time management, prioritization, and then these sort of skills they gain from doing these extra curricular activities from a young age then transfer on well to their work, which then allows them to be very well academically. So it's not about them doing the actual activities, it's the skills they've gained from it, which are then apply to their work, which then makes them really clever, really desirable in terms of you know grades, in terms of doing well in the entrance exams. And therefore, they obviously do tend to outperform others in the interviews. I read a lot at school. What did it give me? Really good sense of time management, but also sense of discipline. If I started something, I'd always finish it. Even if I was up all night, I'd finish it. Rowing, if you start a race, even if it's five kilometers, even if you're dead three kilometers in, you have to finish it. So do you see? So I think from whatever sport you play, given that you put some effort into it, you'll gain many skills. What work experience did you do in regards to medicine? So very quickly, I did some respiratory work in the UK, 
spent some time in Sri Lanka in a general sort of hospital. I also did a &E work experience, did quite a few different like surgery placements from neurosurgery to upper GI to colorectal and also I did a lot of volunteering so at a hospital but also at a care home. Um, yes, just a quick summary. Okay, next question, I'm 0 um, do, do you have any friends that give advice or veterinary medicine? Do medicine and vet med at Cambridge session share some issues? I think historically vet med and medicine are known to be sort of quite collaborative. So I don't know, last year for um, for some of the neuroscience lectures, for some of the pathology lectures and pharmacology lectures, we actually shared um, lectures with the vets. But I feel as if they're sort of shaking things up now where they're sort of splitting them up even more. But I'm not too sure about the sort of what's gonna happen in the future. Maybe read the website about that. Uh, yeah, but yes, we do get to know the vets really well. They're really nice people. Um, yeah. So Harvey Singh, how do you maintain friendships, relationships while being so productive at uni with all the work you do and extracurriculars? So yeah, when it comes to friends, I think people have generally a close friend circle of maybe four or five friends, which they see every day, sort of, or at least a few times a week, they spend a lot of time with. And that's mainly because maybe they meet them in first year or maybe they just share subjects. Um, maybe just, you know, click really, really well. Now, outside of that, people have sort of, I'd say more acquaintances or more just general friends out, you know, from other colleges because it's, it's quite hard to sort of keep many close best friends so yes you know a lot of people from different colleges and that's the thing about Cambridge because you have the different colleges you make friends within your colleges of, from all different subjects but then also because everyone comes together for each subject you make friends from other colleges doing the same subject as well I can't speak for other universities I know like for example UCL the medics just tend to hang out with the medics which sounds a bit sad to me so yeah Maybe read into that before you apply to certain unis. Relationships, good question. Benefits of a relationship. I know you're quite close to someone. You have that support. But also, I guess you just have some, someone else to have like you know really good experiences with and have a lot of fun with. Um, downsides, big time commitment. For some people, maybe a relationship can be quite restrictive. Um, but then again, <clears throat> you know, it's all down to personal preference. I think, given that you're in a good friendship circle or in a good relationship that will be productive for your work. Uh, next question, Trash Can Bob. Um, apply to uni with a few offers. If you weren't allowed to apply to any of the rest of the groups, you're applying issues. Okay, so good question, Trash Can Bob. To be fair for this question, I don't even know other like other Russell Group universities and like non Russell Group, I have no clue. But I know even some medical schools aren't considered Russell Group unis. So I think if you want to go to university Think about where you want to go in terms of your level of aspiration. Certain universities, they provide more opportunities and you know more easily accessible opportunities than other universities, simply because of their history, their connections. That's one thing. Their funding, how much money they have, all that makes a big difference to your education and your experience at university. So yeah, do consider all those things when you choose. Wherever you go, I don't think it defines as a person. It's what you make out of it, which is most important. Okay, next question, Paranormal HD. Should one completely zone out for college studies? No, <laughs> don't zone out for college studies. You want to focus on college studies, yes. You want to commit 70 to 80% of your time to college studies, 100%, yes, I agree. But don't zone out because you'll burn out. Zone out equals burnout. Why? Because you need time to relax. You need time to sort of let things go from your mind to help you then focus on your work when you get back to it. So I'd say, do your college studies, focus on those, but then find some extra curricular activities to help you de-stress. Find time to also look after yourself. Eat well, keep yourself hygienic, dress well, find time for family, you know, all that's important for your own health, for your own well-being. Okay, last question. Um, James Boucher, did you ever compete in math science competitions? And if so, how did they go? Smiley, smiley, smiley. So I know when I was in year 79, I did the, um, UK and math challenge questions where you get the like bronze, silver and gold. As in, I was never really like fantastic, fantastic at math. So I think I got like gold one year, a bronze or like silver another year. I never really got picked for the Olympiads. Bit sad. Um, and a lot of my friends at school, they went for the Olympiad, the kangaroo or whatever, uh, kangaroo wallaby or whatever they're called. Um, as in, of course, it's fantastic if, you're, if you can get onto those. But then again, I think your core exams, which are your GCSEs and A-levels, are much more important. 
Um, I know for science competitions, there are the like International Biology Olympiads, the Chemistry Olympiads, the Cambridge Chemistry Challenge. Again, I didn't do many of these, but I think I wanted to do the Biology Olympiad because it actually seemed quite easy. But the only thing is my school just didn't do it. They had no history in doing it. Well, I think the last kid had done it was like five years ago. So just getting that organized was a headache and I gave up with it in the end. So yes, do get involved in these competitions. I think a lot of Cambridge colleges and even Oxford colleges do like essay writing competitions for all subjects. If you can write a good essay in sixth form or GCSE level um, and then submit it to a college, you'll get a nice prize, you'll get invited to the college. And how useful will that be to help you get an insight into what college life is like at Oxford? There are these opportunities out there. Make sure you sort of follow up on them and make the most of them. I think Jesus College Cambridge actually, um, they're planning on an essay writing competition. So I'll keep you guys updated on that. A bit of a longer video today, but hopefully I've been answering your questions. I think I've got quite a few left. So part three will be coming very soon also. Anyway, as always, thank you so much for watching and I'll see you soon in the next